Science! All right. On science this week, we got some deep space mysterious stuff, which is really fun. And in some of it, we've talked about on previous episodes, um, which is why I love doing this science segment, because if you follow the show and uh, have been following it since its inception, we've done this segment regularly. In fact, it used to be on the podcast forever, you know, yeah, and now yeah. it's on the mini episodes. Um and on the show, but you know, some of these topics we talked about as they began, and now we're learning more data and new data. So it's fun to constantly revisit this. Kind yeah, of thing. I think there's like three main parts of science developments that we're covering right now, which is you know the the launch of something new, yep. and exciting, yep. um, developments of that project that are new and exciting, and then afterwards analyzing the data from those things. Correct, and. Uh, this one is pretty crazy. I'm going to start off with, if you guys haven't heard about this, this actually made national news. It's pretty cool. Scientists found 13 mysterious fast radio bursts from deep in the universe. That's the shit Michio Kaku was talking about. I knew it. Yeah. Now, we did talk about this um, uh, on a much, much earlier episode, but this is really neat. Astrophysicists from CHIME, which is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, collaboration have spotted these 13 new fast radio bursts or frbs um from far outside the milky way now frbs have durations of milliseconds and exhibit the characteristic of uh dispersion sweep of radio pulsars so like real kind of fast kind of radio stuff and we're always scanning the sky with chime with seti with these different things we're scanning the sky for this kind of stuff and the universe itself is a cacophony of sounds. There are a lot of low-frequency, high-frequency sounds coming from all sorts of different stuff, but these are different because they're like, I don't know, there's there's something a little bit different about these radio bursts. These events emit as much energy in one millisecond as the sun emits in 10,000 years. Whoa, could this be like the the bursting of a dwarf star or like, Exactly. It could be that. It could be um, a planet uh, dying. Yeah. It could be. It could be a myriad of different things. That could we be don't a understand. big bang happening on the other side of the of the universe, starting a new universe. Exactly. Exactly. And um, I have a photo here, I believe. Yeah, this is Chime. That is wow. the huge, huge array. That's so cool. Like you're basically sitting on the, the dish right there. And there's a multiple dishes like just I can't not the think sky. of frequency. Frequency. Yeah. I can't not think of it. So astronomers have spotted 13 of these extra galactic light flashes, boosting the known population by about 20%. This new haul of 13 FRBs actually gives us the second ever detected repeating frb now we found one of these i want to say about a year ago and now uh we found the second one which is great because now we can compare the data yeah, between yeah. the two yeah. um and what that is is all of these other frbs that we're finding basically blip on the radar and then they're gone then they never come back but now that we found the second one that we know of two in the universe that have repeated so it's something that's pushing this radio signal out a couple times now again your mind my mind everybody's mind immediately goes aliens I, I you know what i think i've gotten a little bit more calloused right. from that right it's not necessarily aliens in fact um ingrid stairs an astrophysicist at the university of british columbia said knowing that there is another repeater suggests that there could be more out there and with more repeaters and more sources available for study we may be able to understand these cosmic pu puzzles where they're from and what causes them the majority of these 13 frbs detected uh, showed signs of scattering which is a phenomenon that reveals information about the environment surrounding the sound of the the radio waves so it's source. almost like a sonar or radar ish and the amount of scattering observed by the team led them to conclude that the sources of these frbs are powerful astrophysical objects more likely to be in locations with special characteristics uh dr cherry N N an astronomer at the university of Tor by the Toronto way last said, name is literally 
the N-G. letters N and G. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, uh, Dr. Cherry says uh, that could mean in some sort of dense clump like a supernova remnant, kind of like what you just said, or near the central black hole in a galaxy. But it has to be in some special place to give us all the scattering we see. And Dr. Tom Landeker, a scientist at the National Research Council of Canada, went on to say, we now know the sources can produce low-frequency radio waves, and those low-frequency waves can escape their environment and are not too scattered to be detected by the time they reach Earth. This tells us something about the environments and the sources. We haven't solved the problem, but it's several more pieces in the puzzle. Now, what I like to think about is, sure, it could be supernova. Sure, it could be a star dying or forming or something like that that we know of in the universe. But then my mind starts to wander into science fiction and think of Star Wars or think of Star Trek. And think of like, and I'll use Star Trek as an example. But shout out to um, J.J. Joe, actually, who sent us our awesome Enterprise, who is now on our on our, our shelf. But um, uh, so awesome. think, think, of, think of Star Trek. Star Trek has warp power because they have to find a thing called dilithium crystals, right? right? Which is completely science fiction. There is no such thing as dilithium crystals. Yeah. That we know of. What if these radio bursts are from elements reacting and we don't even know about those elements? My example is, is that we know about nuclear fusion, nuclear fission, because those are the way elements that we know reacting uranium and things you know yeah. reacting and we know what those reactions happen if there are elements in the universe that we don't even know exist and then they're reacting with other elements maybe they're creating these radio bursts and we n- had no idea yeah i mean it's radioactive it's radioactive exactly um but this makes me think of a couple things but mostly one is harmful right like who knows who knows there's so many things we don't know in the universe and if yeah. some and if a radio blast like this hits a part of the earth directly should we be worried maybe maybe probably not probably not yeah but the thing that i'm most interested in is something like this can really help us map the universe of course of course because we're finding this is a signal so now we're going to start training stuff on that part of the of space and who knows right, and we'll everything find. that th- that radio wave had to move around. Yes, we can start mapping out. Right, it's like you've got the finish line, and you start. Cause we are the finish line. Yes. so you start working backwards to yeah. to the to the, the starting point. You, right, you know yeah. the areas where the radio wave didn't go through are areas where there is mass. Yes, and you can measure that. Yes, and we can start literally making a map of areas that we've never even thought to be able to discover. Yeah, it's really cool. I definitely recommend if you guys aren't following stories like this you know look up science blogs look up that kind of stuff because this you can really dive into stuff like this and find a ton of information out there and it's constantly being updated because we're in real time dealing with this data i'm telling you about this data and there are scientists at this very moment finding out more about they what could have I'm ma- they could have made the most giant discovery of our lifetime right now it's so cool and speaking of cool another thing we've talked about on this show is a spacecraft called tess and tess is been we talked about when it got launched mm-hmm. um and it is specifically orbiting the earth Training itself on parts of the on parts of the universe, looking for exoplanets, looking mm-hmm. for other planets that could support life, and it's found its third one. Now, as I'm talking, I'm going to show you guys a uh, little bit of a video that um, is a nice animation of some of the planets that Tess has already found. But this third one is named HD two one seven four nine B, and we know that it is two point eight times the size of Earth. Which puts it in the category of think about like a little smaller than Neptune. Okay, that's okay. pretty. That's it's pretty big. damn big. And it also has a mass about twenty three times that of Earth, which is very big. wow. So it's got some weight to it. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Which means it has some gravity to it. Yeah. Wow. Which is cool. But it is unlikely that this planet is rocky and therefore habitable. It is more likely made of gas and a kind of that is much denser than the atmospheres of either Neptune or Uranus. So that is kind of mind blowing just in itself because we have this planet that we know of that 
might be predominantly gas, but is way heavier than our planet, which is predominantly rock. Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> there are very heavy gases in in the universe, and you put them all together, and you can, I mean, look at Jupiter, for example, you know? like That doesn't seem like a place we could live. But, no, but there could, again, when we talk about life in the universe, we know how us as carbon-based life forms right. can live on a planet like Earth. Who knows what maybe could live on a planet like HD21749B. In an ocean. In an ocean. Of gas. Right. Um, uh, I never even thought of that. It, it orbits a star, a K-type star, about 80% of the sun's mass and located 53 light years away in the southern constellation Reticulum. Ret, Reticulum. I cannot pronounce anything right, um, but I'll put that up here. Um, this is an actual photo taken from Tess of the area of the um, of space where this planet is found, which is pretty neat. And the planet's uh, the planet's journey around its parent star is uh, about thirty six days, compared to two other small planets that Tess has discovered. Um, and the planet's surface is likely around three hundred degrees Fahrenheit. Relatively wow. cool given the proximity to its star, which is almost as bright as the sun. Uh, Dr. Um, Dra Dragomir, which I love his name. That's, yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Said, it is the coolest small planet that we know of around a star this bright. We know a lot about atmospheres of hot planets, but because it's very hard to find small planets that orbit farther from their stars and are therefore cooler, we haven't been able to learn much about these smaller cooler planets but here we were lucky and caught this one and can now study it in more detail and that's really excellent that Tess has only been in space for less than a year even and is already I mean the data we're getting from it yeah. is just quite like we, already had three hits we that's put awesome. it out there being like hope it finds something and with three hits in a like, year it's incredible and these are uh, this is just a list of all of the different missions that are currently up there and then ones obviously that we're going to be putting up in the future wow. looking for these different That's such a cool diagram i don't know why seeing all those seeing it's, all those satellites so cool. next to each other and, and and sure like uh, like we've mentioned earlier you know like some of these aren't even like kepler its mission is over now Hubble, unfortunately, just uh, broke uh, last week, uh, um. so we're working, we're working on ways to hopefully fix it. Um, uh, but, you know, we're going to be putting in future exoplanet missions in the next couple of years as well. And uh, finally, what's even more exciting are the hints that this system, where HD21749, um, is it holds a second candidate planet about the size of Earth that orbits the star every eight mm -hmm. days. If this is confirmed, we haven't even confirmed this yet, but if it's confirmed, this would be the smallest exoplanet Tess has found to this date. And that's what's really fun is, is like we get to even report on science that scientists are like, well, we think that's the, a planet. We think that might be a thing. Yeah. You know, we're, we got to look through the data and we got to look at it a couple more times and make sure, but it could be that. So we're, we're finding stuff, again, as I'm talking to you which is great. And if you guys are just, um, uh, one more time, if you guys are just listening to this on our mini episode on the podcast, you can go on over to the Facebook page, Fueled by Deathcast on Facebook, and I'll have all the photos that we've been talking about right up on that Facebook page, and you can follow along with the show. Perfect. Perfect.